So I'm really happy to be here today uh, to introduce all of you to Anusha. Uh, but before that, just to uh, um, say that Outside In is a series of, uh, is a lecture series uh, started by uh, NCBS and the Bliss Communications Office uh, in the hope to communicate more about uh, what's outside the lab. Uh, and uh, probably something uh, fun for us to uh, do, uh, especially since many of us are right now stuck in our homes. So um, that said, uh, you know, the next four talks, uh, starting off with Anusha, will be uh, focused on biodiversity uh, broadly, but in general on, on wildlife, actually, uh, more specifically on wildlife. Um, and um, we'll hear first from Anusha. Thanks so much, Anusha, for joining us. Anusha is a Rose Postdoctoral Fellow at Cornell, uh, and she did her PhD from um, SUNY Stony Brook, uh, where she worked on birds, hummingbirds, and their physiology uh, across the US and um, Central America. Uh, so she's going to tell us more about what she does, but um, you know, she's a really unusual uh, person, young person. She and has a passion for con uh, communicating science. I've known her for many years because uh, uh, one of the people whom I work with and admire, Robin, she worked with him uh, on his uh, work in the, in the Sholas on birds. So she's been interested in birds for very, very long. Uh, and she uh, is going to tell us a little bit about what she's doing now. Uh, thanks, especially because it's very late for you. I know it's one in the morning. Uh, so thank you so much for accommodating us. Uh, and I'm sure uh, the participants will really enjoy hearing from you. Look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Uma. Um, thank you for inviting me and thank you, Sadamini and Pavitra for uh, organizing all of this. It is uh, absolutely an honor and a pleasure uh, to be talking to you all. Um, and thank you for Blisk for having this series. I looked up so many of your videos and they're stunning uh, and super informative. So if any of you haven't seen Blisk talks before, I'd definitely advise going and checking them out. Um, uh, let me share my screen and we can get started. Okay, uh, you can see that, right, Omar? Okay, great. Uh, so I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey and share my journey through my career path, um, starting a little bit earlier than when I met Uma to uh, today, where I'm a postdoc. And on the way, I'll tell you a little bit about the lessons that I learned from wildlife and how they taught me to pay attention and learn things about myself. And maybe you can take some of those lessons home with you and do uh, similar studies of yourself and uh, understand better your relationship to the world around you. So um, I'll talk to you about hornbills and snakes and hummingbirds and all of these different species that I've studied uh, and what they can teach me. I'd like to start with uh, a quote, which I think I live by in many spheres of my life. Uh, and it is that to me, exploration isn't about conquering obstacles. It's not about going where someone's never gone before and leaving my mark. Um, it's about the opposite. It's really about making yourself vulnerable and opening yourself up to whatever's out there and really letting the place leave its mark on you. And this is true for me when I go to a new place, when I meet new people, when I study new species. Um, I think the point isn't to force yourself on any of these things. It's for them to allow you to learn from them. Uh, and this is what I enjoy about science and about traveling and about anything else uh, really in my spheres. Um, so my journey started in India. I grew up, I, I was actually born in Pune, but I grew up for a lot of my life in Chennai. And uh, this is me when I was like three years old playing with a camera case. Um, and I think I was a happy child. I uh, had no idea that being a scientist was a thing uh, or a career path that you could take. So I spent some time at uh, Stella Maris where I did my zoology degree. Uh, this was, I didn't know that I wanted to be a scientist. It just kind of happened uh, with a series of events. So um, I ended up taking a zoology degree because I was interested in human behavior and animal behavior. And this was kind of where my path led me. And then um, 
while I was doing my bachelor's degree in zoology, I decided to go for an internship to Assam. And this was with the Wildlife Trust of India. Uh, they have a rehabilitation center where they rehabilitate a lot of animals that have been injured mainly from human um, conflict um, or have, whose parents have been poached and things like that. So this was an orphaned uh, young bear that they were rehabilitating into the wild. And um, I was there to study these hula gibbons in the forest. So this, uh, there was this young female who had been orphaned at six months when her mother was poached uh, or killed by hunters. So I was there to study her behavior before and after they uh, released her into the forest. And their strategy was to pair her with a wild male so he could teach her how the, you know, the tricks of the forest kind of. So I was there to study her behavior. And this was, this was really my first experience living away from home and uh, cooking my own food. I had no idea how to cook rice in a pot without a pressure cooker. So I was eating like raw rice, not raw, but very undercooked rice with potatoes. Um, and it was, a, it was not an easy time. There were moths flying whenever the current would go out. I would use candles. And moths would fly into my food. It was, it was very dramatic and um, a very extreme first experience away from people that I knew. But obviously I loved it. I mean, I'm still doing stuff like this all the time. Um, and I love the independence of it. And I love being in the forest and watching animals and, and understanding how they behave. So um, I went on to do a master's in ecology in Pondicherry University. But in that time, I went to an, do an internship in Bangalore, where I went to the Indian Institute of Science. And I was studying insects and birds, and I had specific projects. But really, most of my time, I spent walking around the IISC campus, the Indian Institute of Science campus. And I attended a conference, a, a student conservation conference, and volunteered for that. I talked to a lot of people. But I spent so much time just to using my little point and shoot camera, which was good at taking photos of small things and taking photos of insects and plants and anything that I could find uh, and getting good, better at photography. And I loved that time. I also then went uh, to Agumbe, where they have a King Cobra telemetry project. And we followed King Cobras to see how they use their landscape. So my main job there was uh, some organic farming and then watching these king cobras. And I love snakes. This was such a fascinating time uh, watching them move and watching how they survive in these very agricultural human dominated landscapes. Um, so <laughs> I also spent a lot of time taking photos of other things of insects and these butterflies that I found and uh, other snakes that I saw. Um, yeah. Perfecting this photography was it's just, it's, it was a way to connect with nature that was very tangible to me and I loved it. Um, and then ultimately for my master's thesis, I was studying uh, hornbills, which are birds. So for the first time you see birds are coming into the picture for me. And this was quite late. It was when I was doing my master's. Um, this was in the Western Ghats in Maharashtra. And again, lots of photos. Uh, you can see, let me use my laser pointer here. You can see this bug laying eggs. You can see this absolutely stunning map butterfly. Um, and then the first real encounter that I have a memory of with a sunbird. Uh, so this is a purple sunbird. And uh, I didn't know then that I would be studying a very similar species for a lot of my career later on. So I went on, as Uma was saying, to study hummingbirds, which are very similar in behavior and, and what they do in the environment but they're completely unrelated species. Um, so sunbirds are the nectar eaters or the sugar water from plant kind of eaters of um, India. Um, but like uh, I was really there to study these birds, the hornbills. And these are giant birds. They're like the size of my upper body or more. And uh, this species is the Malabar pied hornbill. And what's incredible about them is that they nest in these tree cavities. So they, they have this huge old tree, which has a hole in it. And the female goes inside that hole and she seals up the entrance of the hole with mud and her feces, with her poop. And she stays in there for, depending on the species, between one and a half and three months. And the only way she can eat is if the male comes and brings her food. So the one you see perching on, this, on top of this nest is a male. And he has to feed her and the chicks for as long as she stays in there. If he leaves or he dies or something happens to him, 
um, she she loses she actually loses all her feathers while she's in the nest. She molts, it's called, and she'll be completely helpless. She won't be able to eat, uh, and she and the chicks would die. So this is a very dramatic strategy here. You can see if you look really carefully, you can see uh, the female's beak poking out of the nest here, and the male feeding the female here. A nice little red fruit. So I was, I was there to study how do they choose these nest sites? You know, very often um, we, we as ecologists go to really protected areas and study uh, these very charismatic, very good looking species in, in safe protected places. But the reality in India is that there's very few of those places left and animals are still having to survive in very human dominated landscapes. So I was there to see how do they choose nests in a very human dominated landscape in Maharashtra where there's lots of farming and agriculture um, and, a, and increasing numbers of people. Um, so we used some mapping techniques and we got records of points of where these birds had been sighted all along South India and even in Sri Lanka some sites um, I didn't collect all of this data. I just collected data in the little, the little yellow square. And uh, we can use some mapping models to uh, project what, where else we expect them to be. And that can tell you, does temperature decide where these hornbills are going to be? Does rainfall decide where these hornbills are going to be? Is it land use? Are they limited by where humans are or humans are not? Um, and by predicting from this model, we can find that they are, they could, or the temperature and the rainfall and land use here in this eastern part is also similar and good enough for what they would use in the west coast. So there's things like that you can do with mapping um, that can help us understand what kind of uh, environment an animal needs to survive. And this is the first part where I'll talk to you about what you can learn from yourself. It makes me think about where do I like to exist? Right, what do I need to stay alive? Uh, do I need the shop on the corner that can give me some vegetables? Um, do I need people, like especially during this pandemic we're all becoming aware that we need to be surrounded by some company. Like most of us need some interaction, some social interaction of some sort to stay happy. Um, what is it that you need uh, to be able to exist? And if you were in the middle of a forest somewhere, uh, would you be fine um, without any supplies? Um, Beyond that, I would like you to put yourself in the shoes or in the feet of a hornbill and imagine uh, their habitat closing in around them. And there's fewer and fewer nest trees for them. There's very few large old trees. Um, imagine what it must be like for wildlife to be you know, experiencing all of this human pressure. Um, this is really their world and we've taken over. It's not the other way around, right? Um, so just remember that and think about what you need to stick to exist. So after my master's, about a year later, I went uh, to Stony Brook in New York, in the US, to do my PhD. And that's here in, in, this, in this map of the US, Stony Brook is up here. And this is when I first started to think about what it means to be an ecologist. I always had been doing these field experiences. I went out and studied the gibbons in Assam, and I went to start tracking cobras, and it's very like cool sounding. Um, so I, I imagine the photos always look like this of an ecologist, right? But <laughs> I learned in my PhD that you spend a lot of time looking at your computer. Really, if I had to say what I spend most of my time doing, it's looking at a computer and uh, reading papers and writing my own papers and analyzing data and things like that. So if you have a dream of becoming an ecologist, just know that the Instagram, Facebook versions of ecologists are not always um, what the life of an ecologist is really like. I just want to put that caveat there before I share more fun photos. Um, so I did get to do a lot of field work and I did go to the field and watch animals. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in uh, a few different field sites. One was in Southeastern Arizona in the US, which is over here. You can see already from the map, it's quite dry, much less green than the rest of the US here. Um, and so it looks like this, these deserts um, and mountains sometimes and in the foreground, you'll see these tiny little red flowers, and that's what the hummingbirds feed on in this landscape. I also spent a lot of time in Ecuador, which is in South America. So this is the US that we just looked at. And if you go travel south downwards, you'll see Ecuador, and it's this little country here. Um, and despite being so little, you know, there's 
over 330 types of species of hummingbirds. And Ecuador has over 150 of them, even though it's such a tiny country. Uh, so hummingbirds are only found in North and South America. You won't see them in Asia or Africa or Australia or Antarctica or Europe. Um, they're only in North and South America. And there's so many of them found near the equator here. Um, so I spent about 12 months overall in Ecuador. Sometime, some of that time, about seven months, was at this high elevation site in the Ecuadorian Andes. Um, and, you know, we wouldn't have running water during the day. It would be 40 degrees Celsius, and at night it would be zero degrees Celsius. So these are very extreme conditions, even for a human. And I have jackets and sweaters and heating bottles and all kinds of things. Imagine being a tiny little hummingbird and living in such an environment without a jacket or without a heater and generators and all of that. Um, then I went to Fairbanks, which is in Alaska. And uh, so this is the mainland part of the US. And then this is Canada. If you go even further up north, there's a, the last state in the US is up here. And I was in the middle of that state. This is some of the state is in the Arctic Circle. It's very close to Russia on the other side. And so you can imagine that it gets very, very cold. And this is what it looks like in the winter. Um, it's covered in snow for about eight or nine months in a year. And this was my car. <laughs> and this is what it looks like many mornings when I wake up and I would have to shovel the snow off of the car before I can, I can drive. So it's a, imagine being an animal in this environment. It's so extreme uh, to, be, to be living like this eight or nine months in the year. Again, I had indoor heating, I had running water, I had all kinds of comforts that humans have the privilege of, of having, but um, there were moose, which are giant, uh, not deer, but herbivores. There's um, caribou and there's squirrels, and they all managed to live in this kind of extreme environment. But what I found even more extreme than the cold, it gets to um, often minus 40 degrees Celsius, minus 60 degrees Celsius sometimes, um, but most of the time it was minus 20, minus 30 Celsius in the winter. But more than the cold, I found it really strange to watch the sun and watch the patterns of light. So if you know you grow up in India, you're so close to the equator, you don't think about how, how the sun moves very often. It rises in the east, it goes overhead, and then it sets in the west. Simple, right? It's overhead in the, in the middle of the day. But in uh, high latitude places, which are far from the equator on the poles, the sun does something very different. It never goes overhead. Even in the summer, um, it's always close to the horizon. And uh, in the winter, there's only four hours of sunlight. And in the summer, there's 20 hours of sunlight. So imagine being an animal in this landscape. There's snow covering all of your food sources for eight or nine months in the year. And in the winter, there's only four hours of sunlight. How do you manage to exist in such an extreme environment? Um, and it's not easy for humans either. So I was studying something called seasonal affective disorder or SAD, which is, it's like a seasonal depression that people get in the winter when, when there's not enough light. So um, there's only four hours of, of, of daylight and 20 hours of darkness in the winter. And people get this seasonal affective disorder and it's known to affect how they sleep. So they get, their sleep gets disrupted and it affects the bacteria in their gut, in their, uh, in their digestive system. Um, and then sugar consumption can also affect it. If you start eating more and more ice cream because you're feeling depressed, that can play into this whole loop and make it even worse. So I was studying this uh, rat called the, diurnal, the Nile grass rat, sorry, um, and how it can be used as a model for understanding this whole system and applying what we learn to humans. Uh, so this is what really taught me to think about um, how light can you know, dictate your day. Uh, most of what we do and when we do it is based on when light is available. Um, and now we have indoor lighting, which can change everything. Here I am at 1.30 a.m. talking to you and it's fine. But um, light is a very important timekeeper for all of us and all animals. Okay, so let's shift back. This was my trajectory. This is my overall background and my career path. And now I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I studied more specifically. Uh, so in Ecuador, one of my sites was this beautiful cloud forest site. And uh, in the middle of the day, you'd come out and you'd see the, the clouds below you blanketing the whole landscape. Um, I 
when you dive down beneath these clouds, you can see these hummingbirds. Um, and I hope this video is playing well for you. Uh, if it's not, my main takeaway for this, for you, for you to take away from this, is that they're really small. They're tiny little birds and they can hover, they can stay in one place and fly, which uh, is very unusual among birds. They can go backwards, which no other bird can do. But they're so small and they have to stay light in order to, to be able to fly. So they use up a lot of energy and they barely store any energy. So you and I have all of these fat stores. In case we don't eat a meal or two, we'll be fine because we'll use up the fat and, and get some energy. But hummingbirds don't have that luxury. If they don't eat for maybe two hours, they can die. So they live constantly on a border between life and death. To give you a sense of how small they are, uh, this is an average, uh, average on the lower side, smaller side hummingbird. And it weighs the same as a 10 paisa coin. Some of you might not know what a 10 paisa coin is. This is like 30 years old in this, this particular picture. Um, but they're really small and they manage to exist, right? Uh, if you used energy as fast as a hummingbird, you would need to eat about 300 burgers every single day in order to stay alive. That's how quickly they use energy. And they get this energy mostly from nectar or sugar water from plants. Uh, some of their energy comes from insects. They get some protein from insects, but a lot of their energy comes from nectar. And this also makes them important pollinators. They visit hundreds of plant species in North and South America where they live, and they pollinate all of these plants. So they're important for a healthy functioning of the, of the forest. And what's amazing to me is that they manage to exist in very dramatically different habitats or environments from North America to South America. So they are in these deserts in Arizona, like I showed you. They're in the forests in Ecuador. They're in the high elevation Andes. They can sometimes go all the way up to Alaska in the summer. Um, there's some species all the way down in Argentina and in the high mountains in, the, in Argentina where it gets very cold. And somehow they manage to exist, being these tiny little things. Um, and they manage to do it with absolute beauty and color and grace. So there's this crimson topaz, which is super colorful. There's this tiny little bee hummingbird, which is the smallest hummingbird. Um, this sword billed hummingbird, which has a huge beak, which is longer than its, the rest of its body. And that's the only bird that has that long a beak relative to its body. There's my favorite, the booted racket tail with the tiny little white boots on its legs. And then this is a giant hummingbird. So among hummingbirds, it's really, really big, but compared to other birds, it's not that big. Um, it's about the size of, your, of an adult palm, um, but it's, uh, I think, 10 times the size of or weight of this tiny little bee hummingbird. So there's 330 different types of species of hummingbirds distributed all across North and South America. And what I was really interested in during my PhD was what do hummingbirds spend their energy on? They have so little of it to spend at a time. They have to feed some 48 times in a day. They have to have 48 little meals in a day. What are they spending that, en that precious energy on? Um, you know, just like humans, they have to maintain a high body temperature because they uh, to normally stay functioning during the day. So they are endotherms. They make their own heat. Endo and therm means internal heat. So they're generating their own heat. Unlike ectotherms like snakes or lizards, which allow the outside air to decide their body temperature. So it takes energy to maintain a high body temperature and they're spending energy on that. They're spending energy on hovering and flying and resting. And they're also spending energy at night. So I really wanted to know how are they dividing this energy up because it's so precious. If it was a human, I can just give them an app on the phone. Like I can use this on my phone. I have this app where I track my time. I can see what I'm spending my time on. Or I can just give people Fitbits. Like I have an activity tracker on my watch um, and I can measure what I'm spending time or uh, energy on. But you can't really do that easily for a hummingbird. So uh, for me, I found that I'm spending about 33% of my day, that's about eight hours every day, asleep. It's very good, very healthy. Um, I spend about 5% of my day or one hour every day on average um, exercising. And I have to say, honestly, that this was before the pandemic. During the pandemic, I've barely been doing any exercise, which is very bad. Um, and then the rest of my time is spent on daytime activities. So how is this distributed for a hummingbird? Normally, 
some birds, you can actually do this. You can put something like a Fitbit on them and you can see what they're doing with their time. But with hummingbirds, it would just fall off. They're much too small. And these things are not these, uh, the accelerometers, which are di direction sensing devices in your phone or in the Fitbit, they're not big enough. They're not small enough yet for hummingbirds. So we have to use other ways. Um, first, we catch them. So we're setting up a feeder trap here where there's a feeder with nectar or sugar water in it. And then there's a net around it and the hummingbird goes and feeds and we drop the net and we go and catch the hummingbird gently. And this is what they look like. Um, sorry, I'll just do that again. Um, so on the left, there's a blue-throated mountain gem and you'll see what now why it's blue-throated. Um, and on the right is a black-chinned hummingbird. And you can see that there's iridescence on their necks, which means that at some angles you can see one color and at some angles you can see a different color. Um, and this is one of the amazing things about hummingbirds. So that's how we catch them. And then we measure their energy expenditure in a few different ways. One way is to use this system called a respirometry system. And respirometry, it's derived from the word respire, which is breathing in and breathing out. So you can measure the carbon dioxide and the oxygen in their breath while they're doing different activities. And carbon dioxide, you know, a lot of the body's processes which use energy, they end in carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a good way of estimating how much energy they're spending on different activities. So if you measure their breath and you know how much carbon dioxide, you have a carbon dioxide sensor in the system and an oxygen sensor. Uh, if you measure how much carbon dioxide is in their breath, you can estimate how much energy they've been spending on that activity. And you can do it while they're flying, when they're hovering, when they're just resting, when they're sleeping, and you know how much energy these different activities have taken. So what I found by doing this in multiple places was that they're really flexible in how they use their energy. We used to think that they spend most of their day actually sitting, maybe 75% of the day sitting, but they're actually very, very flexible in how they use their time. Uh, so they spend between three hours and 13 hours a day on daytime activity, like hovering and flying, uh, which is 25 to 80% of their day. And they spend about five to 35% of their energy totally on nighttime stuff. I just want to contrast with me, I spend one hour a day on daytime activities and they're spending three to 13 hours a day flying and hovering. So um, yeah, they're much more active than I am and that I will ever be. Good to know. Um, so here's a point where I take a little bit of a detour and, um, and talk to you about how I collect data on myself in many different ways. By watching hummingbirds, I realized I'm trained to watch animals and very systematically collect information on how they do different things. Why can't I do that for myself? There's so many questions about myself I could answer if I observed myself carefully and systematically. So I collected data on how I use my time, what my mood is affected by, how much I exercise, how much I sleep, and how many glasses of water I drink. Like the questions are endless. You are such a good source of information for yourself. And these can help you answer questions like, do I know enough? Do I work hard enough? Do I work too much? Do I work too little? What makes me happy? These are all questions that I've had and that collecting information on myself in a systematic way has helped me answer. And maybe you can do the same. So I collected data on uh, our information, systematic information, which I'm gonna call data, on how I use my time. And I realized that I, sp I did this for, let me say 880 days, which is about two and a half years. Uh, every 15 minutes in an app on my phone, I would enter what I was doing with my time. And I spent a lot of my time doing administrative things like filling out paperwork and forms and things like that. And very little of my time on actually doing the research which I was supposed to be doing. So by tracking my time, I understood that my, the way I was budgeting my time was not efficient. And so I adjusted it and I had less administrative stuff and more research time. Ultimately, I had a lot more research time and less administrative time by doing my administrative tasks just on certain days of the week or something like that. Um, so I really learned a lot about how I use time um, <laughs> after watching hummingbirds do the same. I also collected data on my mood. Um, so this was about, I'm still collecting this every twice a day, every day for 958 days so far. And uh, I study what my mood is affected by. Is it affected by the, my interactions with people? Is it affected by the weather? Um, or how I feel about my work, what is it that's affecting my mood? And I really wanted to know, am I an average happy person? 
So uh, this is the distribution of my mood on average. This is very, very happy. This is very, very sad. And this is, uh, this is good. So you can see most of the time I'm pretty good. There's some days which are kind of meh, and then some extreme and bad days. Um, but overall, I'm pretty happy. And then it, this kind of data, this is also with an app on my phone. I can also see what days of the week I tend to do best at. Uh, so I seem to love Fridays, which is maybe true for a lot of you. And I seem to not like Tuesdays very much. Um, so this is all good to know. And this it's very hard to know when you're living your life what these patterns might be. But if you step back and collect it systematically, uh, it can really reveal a lot about yourself. So going back to um, Alaska, for example, this was one place where my mood was really interesting. When it was winter, you remember that I was telling you that people get seasonally depressed in the winter because there's so little sunlight. I was actually pretty happy. And you know, I think of myself as a tropical person who likes warm temperatures and likes lots of sunlight, but I was pretty happy. I learned that my hair can freeze, which is a fascinating thing. Um, your breath just gets caught on the hair and then it freezes. Um, what was weird was that I struggled in the summer when there was a lot of sunlight there was no start and end to my day. And so I was working a lot more and I didn't know where my day was ending and there, everyone else had left to go away for the summer. And it, it was just a very strange time. And it was so much harder for me than the, than the winter. Um, <laughs> this is how I would look in the summer. So my relationship with light and with time were very different and, than I imagined. I also found that I'm really happy when I'm talking to young audiences and talking, giving a talk like this one to you all, it makes me so happy. Um, I also love dancing. So I salsa dance. And these are the things that keep me happy in uh, apart from doing science itself. I also love planting uh, and gardening. I think I inherited this from my mom. Um, the other thing I love doing is reading fiction. And I've been reading every week for about, uh, so again, data collection on myself, every week for about uh, 111 weeks, which is about two years. And uh, last year I, I read 44 books and this year so far I've read about 32 or 34 books. So collecting data on yourself can really help you tune your life to be the best life that you want it to be. Um, let me quickly tell you what I am going to do here in Ithaca. I just started my, it's called a postdoctoral position after your PhD, you can do a postdoctoral position. And I just started my position here. And I'm really interested in knowing what hummingbirds do at night. So I want to uh, bring you this analogy. So your computer, when it wants to save energy, it goes into sleep mode or it goes into hibernate mode. And with sleep, you can just like touch a button or something, it'll come awake, right? But with hibernate, it takes some more time. You have to press the power button. You have to enter your password again, whatever. It takes, it takes a little bit more time, but it's also been saving more energy. Just like that, Animals have hibernation modes, some animals, some species, and sleep modes. So you know that we sleep, humans don't hibernate. Um, and there's a kind of trade-off, there's some cost and benefit to doing these different strategies. If you're just asleep, then you're spending a lot of energy, but you can respond when something happens outside. So if you're, I don't know, my mom would wake me up, would shake me awake, and I can respond and wake up. But if you're hibernating, you can't do that. You can't respond to anything for about 20 or 30 minutes until your body warms back up and you're able to respond to outside stimuli. And I'll show you some videos of how this happens. So hummingbirds um, are uh, so, they, you know, how do they exist at night? Because they're using up so much energy during the day and at night it's dark and they can't see and they can't feed on anything. And you remember I told you that they'd have to feed every two hours if they wanted to stay alive. So at night, what they do is they use this strategy called torpor, which is a kind of hibernation. And it saves them a lot of energy, but the disadvantage is that they are susceptible to predators or to, if anything happens outside, they can't do anything about it for about 20 or 30 minutes. So I was, uh, I went and studied this by using this very high-tech thermal camera. So it measures temperatures of any surface. And we pointed it at this tiny little hummingbird here. And we studied three different types of hummingbirds. The black chin, which I already showed you, the black chin hummingbird, the blue-throated mountain gem, which I already showed you the video of, and this Rivoli's hummingbird. And this is what a video looks like of them. 
So the colors here, uh, this is so far a, a picture, I'll show you the video in a minute. The more purple colors are more cold and the more red colors are more hot. So where you see this asterisk here, that's the eye. And around the eye, it has the least feathers. So you can see through to the skin and it's the warmest part that we can see. So that's what we're really interested in, looking at that eye temperature. I'm gonna play this video and you can see that the hummingbird is breathing. Its eyes are closed, I'll tell you, but um, it's asleep. So it's using up energy like normal. Its body is at a high temperature. This is a video, and I promise it's a video, it's not just a photo, of a hummingbird that's in torpor. And it's cold. It's become like an ectotherm, right? It's let go of the control of its body temperature and the, it's the same temperature as the outside air. And it's like your laptop going into hibernation mode. It's saving so much energy, like 90% of the energy or something uh, around there when it's in this kind of state. But it can't do anything for 20 to 30 minutes uh, until it warms back up. So I'm really interested in this strategy. Um, this is another view we can take. That's again, the eye with the asterisk. And you can rotate this and see how the body's temperatures are distributed across the surface of the body. And what I plan to do here is take a look inside the hummingbird. What is happening? Which processes are still on and which processes are still off? Is its heart still beating as much as normal? I, it, does, it doesn't beat as much as normal. We already kind of know that. Um, but what, what physiological processes, what internal body processes are still running and not running? Um, you can imagine all kinds of applications for this. Like if you know, NASA wants to send humans to deep space, and humans would take up a lot of energy if they were eating and live, living and laughing and doing everything they normally do. But if you could make humans hibernate, it's very sci-fi and very distant future kind of um, imagination. <laughs> but um, by studying hummingbirds and animals like them that can go into this deep state of energy savings, we can understand something fundamental about how animals exist um, in different environments. And also on a lighter note, I learned that I am definitely a night owl. I can stay up and watch these hummingbirds all night because that's when they use torpor. Um, and I have really, really weird dreams when I'm um, waking up and going to sleep and studying these hummingbirds in torpor. Um, so I'll share with you the end of my trajectory. And after, in a couple of years, I would love to go back to India, come back to India and do research there and uh, study tropical animals and study how they manage to exist in changing environments using many different techniques. And I want to keep dancing. Um, and I, I would like to leave, with, leave you with some more ideas to collect data on yourself. You can collect data on how you use your time if you're interested, how much uh, energy is going in and out. Um, are you spending enough time relaxing? Uh, what kind of food are you eating? Are you eating the food you should be eating? Are you drinking enough water? Are you exercising enough? Sorry. <coughs> How do you spend money? Money is a great budgeting, um, data collecting kind of thing to, to know how you're using it. Um, I, how much plastic do you produce in a year? How much waste do you produce in a year? How many smiles do you get in a day? How many smiles do you give in a day? Like there's so many things you can understand and learn about yourself and the people around you by observing it and paying attention to it and collecting data on it. And so um, I'll circle back to that first quote of letting the place leave its mark on you. You can see that hopefully that I was trying to learn from my studies of hummingbirds to also learn more about myself. Um, I started as an ecologist, but I had to learn physiology and had to learn lots of statistics and electron how to use electronics. I learned Spanish without ever taking classes by just going to the field. Um, and I keep thinking, you know, I was in school and I really didn't like math, mathematics very much. There's lots of subjects that I learned that I wasn't that interested in. But later I realized that, you know, inspiration and ideas can come from so many different fields. Even though I'm a biologist, I have to do so many other things to make my biology work. And this is something to keep in mind. Don't like poopa any subject because maybe it'll be useful one day. Be open to learning new things. And really open your eyes to the environment around you and let it teach you um, whatever it can. But most importantly of all, please ask questions and please seek out answers. Um, and I would love to thank the people who have funded me this, thus far. And you can always 
Um, we have plenty of time, I think, to ask for you to ask me questions, but you can also find me later if you think of something later. Thank you. Thanks, Anusha. It's really exciting. Um, there's a bunch of questions from uh, Krishnan, but uh, I'll go ahead and ask uh, one uh, quick question. If that's okay. I'm curious about this, uh, you know, uh, trying to look at temperature within hummingbirds. Um, uh, do you think that in torpor there'll be variation? Uh, I'm not interested in temperature. I'm actually going to do like transcriptomic stuff. So I'm going to look at what genes are being expressed and which physiological processes are turned on in the liver, in the heart, in the brain, at different parts of the brain, uh, in the muscle. Um, and I expect that, you know, the, the liver won't be functioning much. There's no point of a liver when you're just a, in a vegetative kind of state like torpor. But I expect the brain to still be functioning to some extent and the heart to be functioning to some extent. Um, I have gotten asked by my reviewers when I've submitted this paper, like, could there be variation within the body? And so you can put a probe inside them uh, or put a, put a little uh, pit tag or some, some way of measuring body, internal body temperature. But I really don't think it'll change very much. Over the, surface, over the inside of the body. They're so small. Great. Yeah, great. Thanks. So I think, uh, Krishnan, would you like to, since you have several questions, would you like to, can he, uh, Pavitra, can he actually ask them live or? Yeah, uh, he can just unmute himself and ask. Uh, one second. Yeah. Um, I can also read them out, but if you'd like to, you're welcome to join, Krishnan. Um, I. No? Uh, okay, I'm making him a panelist just for a moment due to his version of Zoom. He's not able to raise his hand, I guess. So uh, if he wants to ask his question, he can go ahead. Uh, but please, you know, don't go into extreme detail for each question. Yeah, thanks, Krishnan. Remember that, uh, you know, hopefully everyone can uh, participate in these questions. So uh, please go ahead. Are you there? Okay, perhaps Uma, you can just start Thank with you. this first question. Um, yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, Krishnan asks, how do you ensure that your respiratory measurements are not influenced by stress for the hummingbird when they are in these artificial lab environments? That's a great question uh, and something that all wildlife biologists think about a lot. Uh, I think it's hard to eliminate stress completely. Um, capturing animals is definitely a stressful event for them, it's unusual. Um, but in the scheme of what the comparisons we want to make, we expect that that stress is affecting all of them. And so hopefully we're getting similar kind of measurements from all the animals. Um, we also try to minimize stress in every way possible. So we give them food so that they're never starved. Um, and in my case, we never kept them in a, a artificial, completely artificial lab environment. We always expose them to natural temperatures, natural light conditions, natural, as much, as many variables as we could. So hopefully we were minimizing stress as much as possible. That's definitely something we worry about. Great. I think the next question is, is it true that even in torpor, the bird needs to awaken intermittently to prevent itself from going into an irre irre irreceivable physiological deterioration? Is That's a great question. <laughs> It was <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, so I'm guessing that you've seen a lot of the hibernation kind of studies. And in those cases, like uh, when I was in Fairbanks, there were these Arctic ground squirrels and they hibernate for eight months in a year. They are just in this like state of energy saving because ev all their food is covered by snow and it's so cold. And so to stay alive, they are hibernating, they're switching their bodies down and uh, they do come up every, every couple of weeks or so out of hibernation to um, kind of refresh their body and then go back down. Hummingbirds are just doing this every night. So when they usually when they start a top about, they're in that top about for a while and then they'll come out in the morning about an hour before sunrise and warm themselves up and then go and feed. And so usually within a night, a hummingbird doesn't do go down, come up, go down, come up, because it's expensive to warm yourself back up. So basically they're using torpor instead of sleeping, uh, instead of sort of, instead of sleep, or do they also sleep? 
This is a tough question. So animals that hibernate are often thought to be sleep deprived as a result of hibernation. Mm -hmm. um, so they often have to come out of hibernation and then sleep for some time so to overcome that sleep depression, uh, sleep deprivation, sorry. And we don't know if that's the case for hummingbirds. Um, birds can do weird things when they're migrating, right? They can shut off half their brain and still keep going. Um, so we don't know. And that's one of the questions I would love to answer. What, how much in their brain is still functioning? Sorry, can I just ask one more question? Please? Sure. Uh, so, you know, the thing is that there are, you, you, you suggested there are, uh, whatever, 300 plus species of hummingbirds, which live uh, in very varied environments, uh, you know, latitudinally, um, as well as elevationally. And um, you may predict that the need for torpor, uh, I don't know, may be higher or lower in specific locations. So could you maybe use a comparative approach to um, investigate whether torpor is really providing a better way to utilize energy for a highly energy constrained species. That's kind of your thought process, right? That torpor is allowing these birds to much more efficiently use energy, which is a very precious resource for them. Yes. Um, and that's kind of one of the big things I set out to study in my PhD, to do, do a comparison at different elevations and on, across a mountain. Uh, and I really expected that I was studying these birds in Arizona in the desert where it gets very cold at night. It gets to three degrees Celsius, 10 degrees Celsius. And Ecuador where it's 23, 26 degrees Celsius, much warmer. And I really expected the Ecuadorian birds to use torpor much less because the colder it is, the colder your body gets and the more energy you save in torpor. And so I expected that colder environments would have more energy savings, more hummingbirds would use torpor. But I found that they all use torpor. Whether it's warm or cold at night, they're all using torpor. And uh, so far, I think only one species that has ever been studied, maybe out of the 30 or so species for which torpor has been studied in hummingbirds, only one species has been found not to use torpor. And surprisingly, it's not the largest one. It's an intermediate, like 10 gram one. Um, so I think, I think, Temperature decides how much energy they're saving, but uh, it's not, there isn't a clear pattern yet. Okay, great. So there's another question about climate change, again from Krishnan. Given recent studies that the size of birds is decreasing due to climate change, do you think there are physiological impacts of such change to hummingbirds in particular? I get asked this question often. Um, and it's very tempting to give a very clear answer, but I can't, uh, honestly. It's so hard to know because if it gets colder, then they'll save more energy in torpor, for example. If it's warmer, then they'll save less, but other things will happen during the day. Like it's a very complicated thing. Um, temperature can affect birds directly, but it can also affect the plants that they feed on. And so there can be direct effects of climate change on hummingbirds in multiple directions, depending on where they're living but there can also be indirect effects because the climate is affecting the plants that they feed on. Um, and so it, it's, it's far too complex for us to have, for me to give you just a yes or no answer kind of to this now. There's a question from Sahana. Do we know that, do you know this, do we know the stimuli which can trigger torpor? Can we induce the hummingbird to enter torpor in the lab? Um, excellent question. No idea. Um, I mean, inducing torpor is, it depends on the size of the hummingbird. I think if it's cold um, and they have the kind of conditions that they'd need normally, that they're in naturally, um, the smaller hummingbirds will always use torpor. Uh, the larger ones tend to avoid it sometimes if they've had access to energy and they can feed and store some energy in their body. Some of them do, do spend the night uh, often without using torpor. Um, the stimuli, People think that it's like the percentage of fat in their body. So if they have stored some amount of energy in the night, if they have enough, then they can avoid torpor the whole night. But if they, they are kind of, they have to enter torpor. And if they're migrating, then that fat threshold changes because they're trying to save energy. And so torpor can help them add even more fat. Um, and that's the only time when they're really getting, they can become double their weight when they're going to migrate. Um, so. The trigger, I think, is mostly an energy threshold kind of thing, but we don't know exactly yet. And what you're talking about, uh, Anusha, are um, whole body things. But from a, from a mechanism perspective, there must be some molecular trigger. And that, I think, maybe Sahana, I know she's a student at NCBS. 
maybe something she was also uh, keen to know but i guess there's probably no information on that i'm hoping that with this with this postdoc and the doing the transcriptomics i can get closer to that because we found that some hummingbirds are able to do an in between state where they're not just sleeping or in deep topper they're using a shallow version of topper and they're saving just a little bit of energy and shutting off some things and if we study which genes are expressed at all these three different levels um hopefully we can understand more about the triggers great there's another maybe i'll take a youtube question uh, yes. so uh, azim khan asks uh, there was a study reporting that flowers are changing colors when compared to the same species before anthropogenic activities how might this change in color affect birds there have been some really interesting papers on hummingbird vision recently um which were which used two different colors and saw how much hummingbirds preferred them color can i mean they can see really well in color um and i can imagine that the colors changing could affect how they feed on plants and how they find them but they're very curious and very exploratory species in general so it's somewhere in the region of red pink purple they'll probably find it um that's that's called a hummingbird syndrome a hummingbird pollinated syndrome kind of plant um so if it changes within those i wouldn't imagine it it stops them from feeding on that plant great that's that's really uh, nice to hear because there's also been some work uh, by a colleague of ours shannon olson looking mm -hmm. at uh, elevation and how uh, flowers and their attractability to how a flies changes um, there's another question from youtube uh, uh, these cameras use infrared light from living surfaces to get temperature i guess that's how how are the how are these cameras doing this is that correct that's right yes yeah okay so go back uh, to the questions here there's a compliment saying great session ma'am and waiting for more webinars like this basil <laughs> um a question from gopal uh oops it just disappeared uh, yeah can you please enlighten us on how birds are able to migrate do they have a uh, magnetic tissue in the brain which acts like a compass wow that's a nice uh, way to think about it yeah that is a nice way to think about it um i don't i'm not by any means an expert on bird migration but um uh i think magnetism is is something that people have found uh to be a guiding kind of light for for some species uh i just learned recently that birds um have light receptors or photoreceptors under their skull mammals don't do that mammals only see through our eyes and we only perceive light through our eyes so if you cover our eyes or you, uh, if a person is blind they cannot sense light um at all really if they're completely blind birds can sense light through their skull um they have photoreceptors in their brain uh, that can sense light even if you blind a bird or or close its eyes or cover its eyes up with a cloth or something you have to also cover the top of its head for it not to see light so i wonder sometimes if um even if their eyes are closed and they're sleeping or something their brain can continue them on a, on a course um on a migratory course um yeah i i don't know all the answers to migration for sure but i found that really fascinating and learned it recently Uh, thanks anusha there's a really nice question from gunjan and this is actually something which i think a lot of us face in india because you know the kind of work you talked about is very much about quantification you know yeah. uh, quantifying respiratory rates quantifying temperatures and so on and so forth and this question from gunjan says i use ebird and collect data so she's obviously a bird enthusiast but i don't have access to any instruments to learn about the bird what more can i do to learn about bird behavior and diversity that's a great question uh, gunjan and i'm sure many people can learn uh, from this kind of context i mean when i was in india too and for a lot of my phd i didn't have all of the fancy equipment either and i would go out and watch birds in a systematic way so go along a transect and walk and see how many birds of different types you see um another way is to maybe work with people who do have those instruments and and work with their labs but if you don't have access to any of that i think there's um other than doing transects you ebird is a wonderful resource there's like the number of ebird papers is mind blowing you can take any species and see how its distributions have changed across time you can start learning to use a mapping so software like there's free mapping resources like qgis it's called qgis and that's what i used for those hornbill maps that i showed you um and those softwares are all free you can get satellite data and and put ebird data on top of that 
and it predict where birds would be in different at different times or in different conditions, environmental conditions. And those things are the things you don't need any uh, resources other than a laptop for. Thanks for that, uh, Anusha. And, you know, Gunjan, uh, I, uh, you know, you may have heard about the recent report called State of India's Birds, where uh, citizen science records were put together to help us better understand changes in uh, distributions of bird species. And uh, such efforts can go uh, forward for uh, planning conservation. And I think that Suhail uh, Kadar, who was involved uh, principally in this effort, also gave a talk in Outside In, maybe, I'm right, Pavitra? Yes, 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 it was great. So you could look at his talk too and uh, learn a bit more about it. From a perspective of physiological ecology, Maria Thakur, uh, who also gave a talk uh, here as part of this series, uh, does physiological ecology in lizards. And uh, she's just recently also published some really nice work uh, it would be great for you to you know, look at some of the, that work as well. But what you're saying is very right. There's very few people who do this kind of work uh, in India. There's another question from YouTube from uh, Roop Katha Bhattacharya. Some people feel depressed during the winter. Do hummingbirds also feel something similar during torpor? Do these energy saving strategies cause long-term changes in their brain activity and behavior? It's a very um, insightful question. I, you know, one thing is like, how, what is depression and how do you assess it in an animal that can't speak to you? This is a fundamental thing that you first need to answer before you can ask if an animal is depressed. And there are tests to do this that have been developed for mice and for rats. I don't think those tests exist properly for birds. So I don't know if we think that birds are depressed yet. Um, so the first question to answer would be that. The second is, I think in torpor, so many of our functions are off. I don't think that they would feel depression in that kind of completely off state. Um, like if your computer is powered down and in hibernation mode, then is it really feeling any, is, is it functioning at all, right? Um, and the long-term effects is, is an excellent question. I don't know. Um, I some Some studies have found that animals that hibernate and go into torpor live for longer because there's less, um, there's these bad things that are produced every time you're, you're spending energy like uh, reactive oxygen species, all these, these, these kind of costs of staying alive. And if you slow everything down and you slow your life down and slow how much energy you're spending down, then those costs might be decreased. And so uh, animals that tarp, use torpor might, Hummingbirds live really long for their body size. So using torpor might actually be an advantage to their lifespan. Great, thanks, uh, Anusha. There's another question from YouTube, uh, from Azim Khan. Uh, does this mean that hibernation is not the same as sleeping? What are the major differences? And do they also, uh, is it also seen in regions other than a visible region of electromagnetic radiation? Uh, sorry, those were, I think, those were two separate questions. One was about the, uh, you know, the difference between uh, torpor and uh, sleep. Yeah. And yeah, the second, I think, was about, you know, what you were talking about, their vision. Cameras, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry. Two yeah. different questions. So first one is, uh, is hibernation uh, not the same as sleeping? And what are the major differences? Yeah, thank you for asking that, actually, Azim. Uh, people always say, oh, haha, I can also use hibernation because it's just deep sleep and I'm also lazy like that. Um, but they're very, very different states. Uh, so like, you know, I've watched these hummingbirds with this thermal camera and usually they're breathing really, really fast. They're breathing so many times in a minute, but when they're in torpor, you'll see them not breathing for about 10 seconds. And then suddenly they'll take four deep breaths and then not breathe for a while. And their heart is slowed down. So they're conserving so much energy. We can't even, I can't even imagine what processes are still on in their body and which ones are not. Um, so it's not sleep at all. Like sleep, we regenerate, we uh, drain up all the, drain all the toxins out of our head. We do so much in sleep um, to keep our bodies healthy. And why do we need to sleep? We spend one third of, one third of our lives asleep and it serves some function. Um, and I don't think that function is served when they're in torpor. So they're very different states. And your second question, uh, do they, they oh, also see in regions other than visible? Yeah. Oh, so do, can hummingbirds see in other regions other than visible, the visible spectrum? I think they can see in ultraviolet light. 
um, on the ultraviolet spectrum. Um, I, like I said, there was a recent, recent paper on hummingbird vision, but other than that, I don't know how much has been done. I think like all birds, they have a fourth color sensing um, type of cell in their eye, which can sense ultraviolet light. So a fourth cone uh, to sense ultraviolet light as well. Thanks. There's a question from Aradhna. Is there a reason for flexibility of hummingbirds in utilizing their time on a genetic level? Difficult question, I guess. Um, the first place my mind went to was that the genomes are reduced in size relative to what's expected for their body size so that they can be lighter. And this is a hypothesis that has been proposed. So there's a lot of re regions in their genome that you would expect such a bird to have that they don't have. And the idea is that their genome is condensed so their nucleus can be lighter, so their whole body can be lighter. Um, so at the genetic level, like at the genomic level, um, they are unusual for birds that compared to other birds which are closely related to them. Um, and that's the hypothesis is to keep them staying light. So if it can, if, if the genome can change its size based on, um, to, to help with their body size being lighter then uh, I guess, yes. Wow, that's pretty amazing. I mean, it's really amazing to hear. So right. uh, this, uh, this uh, another question, which I think is really uh, interesting. Are there bird species in India that go into torpor? I will come back and study that and let you know. I don't think it's been studied yet. Um, sunbirds yeah, in exactly. Africa. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Finish what you were saying. Uh, people have studied sunbirds and whether they use torpor in Africa. And I think they can lower their body temperature just a little bit. Um, and there are pigeons that like lower their body temperature five or six degrees Celsius and go into shallow torpor. But deep torpor, I'm not sure. Maybe in the Himalayas, you know, it's possible. There are European species that come to the Himalayas. I was going to ask about that because, you know, uh, in the Himalayas, you have high elevation with lower oxygen as well. Um, and uh, that might be an interesting additional trigger for uh, the, you know, for torpor. There are certainly, yeah, but is it just about cold? Is it just temperature alone or is it because oxygen is another stress, uh, physiological stress. Uh, so I'm just curious whether that might also uh, push towards torpor or maybe not. Um, I haven't thought of oxygen as much. We've found birds at all elevations using torpor um, for quite a few hours every night and to quite a deep depth. Um, so yeah, oxygen could be, but what direction would we expect it? I don't know. We would expect high elevation birds because of the cold to use torpor more. I don't know how oxygen would affect them. Mm -hmm. So it's confirmed in that sense because higher elevation birds, it's also colder and there's also less oxygen, right? Yeah, so it, it is confirmed. To really look at. People have been doing these uh, flying experiments with hypobaric chambers so that they use a mixed mixture of helium oxide and, and normal oxygen um, and see how hard it is for a hummingbird to fly or how much time um, it takes for them to slow down and things like that. Um, how much weight they can carry, that's, that's a common test. So just, we have time for a couple more quick questions. Does yeah. sugary water provided by humans change hummingbird feeding behavior? And if so, uh, what happens during migration? Very good question. Excellent question. It's dramatically changed um, where hummingbirds are. In the US, there's a species called the Annals hummingbird, which has been migrating further and further north with time. And the main thing that seems to have changed is, changed is how, how much um, people have been feeding hummingbirds with feeders. Uh, so yes, it can definitely, let a, there are even some populations of this Annals hummingbird that are becoming permanent residents rather than migrating up and down, they're just staying there. And there's other populations which are migrating up and down. Um, so feeders are definitely changing hummingbird behavior. It, there, so many people put them up um, and they can, they can definitely influence hummingbird abundances. Yeah, this is one of those things we need to be careful about because you know, a lot of times, a lot of us feel we're doing uh, good things for nature uh, by some kinds of interventions. Even for example, planting trees. Planting trees in India is a very big you know, strategy thought of as conservation 
but there are many places where planting trees is ecologically the wrong thing to do uh, because they are semi-arid, they're savanna or uh, you know drier habitats. So this could be one of those things where people feel like, oh, we're feeding the birds, but that may not be such a good uh, option ecologically. Thanks for that question. Uh, this last question uh, we'll take from Harshit. Uh, Harshit Mishra asks, compared to insect pollinators, how well do hummingbirds pollinate as only the beak is used? Also, are any hummingbirds nectar thieves? And like some sunbirds here in India, are they nectar thieves? Um, I'll forget the second question, so I'll answer it first. Yes, there are definitely hummingbirds that are nectar thieves. Uh, I think one of the Spanish names for them is pincha flores, which is like pinching the flower and going and poking the flower and getting some nectar out of the back of it. Um, and you know, plants and hummingbirds have been co-evolving for millennia and plants are, I don't, I won't, I won't say clever, but they've evolved to, to find ways around um, hummingbirds using their nectar. So there are plants which have uh, pollen, which go out and drop themselves on the head of the hummingbird. Um, and so it's not just the beak, actually. Sometimes we catch hummingbirds which have pollen all over their faces. Um, and I think they're pretty good pollinators, yes. Okay, I just like, thanks so much, Anusha. I just like, uh, Saudamini, if you could come back for a minute. Uh, uh, we really owe this series to Saudamini. Uh, she's taken a lot of initiative to uh, get us all started uh, and together here. So thanks so much, Saudamini. Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks, Anusha, for a ni very uh, nice talk. And thanks, Uma, for uh, choosing the speaker this month uh, and also hosting the question answer session, conducting it very well, uh, and uh, agreeing to co host this month with me. And I would like to thank the communications team for uh, helping us with the series as ever. Uh, they are very efficient organizers. And um, yes, especially the audience. And it's really nice to see you, uh, many of you back uh, in the second phase of the series. And uh, yeah, thanks for the wonderful questions. And uh, I'm glad that you enjoyed this stunning talk. And uh, yeah, you all take care and uh, we will see next week. Same time, 11 a.m. Thanks, Sodamini. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Anusha. And, uh, thanks, the Anusha, again. Yeah. Thank you and, all so much. Yes. Yeah, next week, we're going to have uh, Ian Mendenhall from Duke NUS, who's going to speak about bats and uh, emerging infectious disease. Um, so thanks, Anusha, and hope you get some sleep. <laughs> Enter that into your <laughs> app. <laughs> and you're happy tomorrow. And uh, thanks, everyone, and uh, take care. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you all of you for attending and uh, please do register for the next session. The link is in the chat. Uh, so we'll be ending the session, but please register now. Bye.